to four, the picture grows. The first thing I noticed as I exited through the swing doors was the decaying smell that was growing stronger. And yet, even in the blurry darkness of the access corridor to which all the other observation domes were linked, there was no sign to pinpoint where the odor was originating from. It was as if someone had hidden the source just out of eyeline, daring and tempting me to find it. As I walked along the corridor, I made it a point to check in each of the dome rooms just to make sure I hadn't missed anything from my searches below. Man, even when I'd been up there looking down, it was still so surreal. For all those first few rooms, I could still make out the disembodied robot I'd not long fought to the death with. I can still recall that my body still shook and felt numb, all while still being racked with pain from the onslaught. Wasting no further time, knowing that I had to continue on to find the answers as to what the hell was going on here and who this Richard Lambert was other than being a convict, I'd made my way out from the observation dome area and out onto what appeared to be another long-ass corridor. Either this place was a maze or someone had designed this place just to make sure everyone got in their daily exercises. There were still no windows, no indication of what time of day or night it was, yet the metallic walls here seemed to have a slightly, if not a warmer feel than the previous set I'd only recently traversed, if only in that they had a few potted plants at either end. Yet, on closer inspection to the nearest one to me, I saw that it wasn't a real plant, more like a plastic or manufactured one that didn't require maintenance, or if it did, very little. The neon white lights that hung overhead illuminated the entire length, yet some appeared to be flicker and sparked, as if on their way out, and would re require to be changed out in order to not look out of place going forward. Running across the length of the left-hand side wall was a huge muriel-like painting, one you would find splashed across the side of a building to denote its function or who worked there. It was a picture of two halves on the farthest wall and away from me was a 40-ish year old man with silvery streaks in his hair, slim build, clean shaven, wearing a neatly pressed expensive grey suit with a red tie and white shirt. To all intents and purposes, he was clearly an, an executive of some description, possibly even the head of the company, which was emblazoned next to him, with his body outreaching, extending his right arm with his left hand pressed firmly against his chest. The logo on the side closest to me was that of a halcyon age, progressing to that of a, fu of a futuristic society of tranquility. Below that was a long line, which, after reaching a point, angled downwards at a sharp angle, turning backwards, colored in a silvery white with a name called Population, with the slogan beneath saying, Population is our regeneration. I had no idea at the time what this meant or why I was a convict that had been chosen, but now I had a name, a company to look for and investigate. Looking away from the wall to the right side midway down the corridor was a singular set of doors with what appeared to be a device of some kind attached to the wall. It looked like a swipe card was needed if I was going to gain access to this area. A thought occurred to me to just bash it down by putting force against it, but I would need to wait until my body had recovered and felt strong enough to levy the weight needed if I couldn't find a keycard that worked on it. After deciding to leave the room and come back, I continued on down the corridor towards the far end. Even then, the smell of decay grew stronger, and still I had no idea as to what was causing it, but... It had started to become overpowering to a point where I had it had no choice but to cover my hand over my nose just to try and keep the stench out. With each step I wanted to hurl 
The smell was now making my stomach do notches. Even breathing it in gave me reason to cough, turning my eyes to running tears and leaving a foul taste in the back of my throat. Once I'd reached the far end of the corridor, I saw two sets of double doors. Each were laminated with sections above them. The nearest one read as preparation area. The second signaled the end of the corridor. Having turned to a point, read out as participation area with a light box next to it and a sign running against the wall next to, to the metallic swing doors saying when the light shows red the show is live. Show? What show? I remembered thinking, wondering what had been going on here. With intrigue getting the better of me, I pushed the metallic swing doors open of the participation area. It was then and there I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The room itself was huge, grandiose in scale, like that of an amphitheater, rows on rows, almost counting ten to twelve rows, for what I could only assume were audience members. On the center stage was ten metallic blocks for people to stand on in full view of the crowd. High above the stage, stretching the entire length of the theater, was a gargantuan screen display for everyone to see. Along with facing towards the stage, the stage placed evenly set out five production cameras. A set of stairs cut the row in two, as if serving a twofold purpose of allowing the audience to file in taking their seats, and also so some sort of host could have easy access to the masses that once came here. However, that was not the worst or the most horrific sight that unnerved me as I looked out upon this area. For sat in the seats were banks and rows of corpses, all in various states of decomposition, all slumped in various poses. Some had even now turned fully skeletal. Each was still clothed. It was almost as if they had just sat and watched themselves to death, as if it didn't look as though there had been any struggle, fight, or attempts to leave. Laying on the steps, midway up, was another skeleton. This one seemed to be a host of some kind, as if they were wearing a flashy red suit with silver strips on their edges. An earpiece had fallen to the floor besides where their ears had been, and poking out of one of the pockets was a set of cards with names on them. The first one I saw was Doris Deckerman, 23, Block 2, Crime, Aiding and Stealing Vital Data, Video Package Time, 11 minutes in. Make sure to speak to the guest, sitting in row 5, 14, added in the brackets. As I flicked through the other cards, each had a name on them and a reason for being on the blocks, followed by who the host should speak to, none of which it had been my name, or any indication that they had been on them. In one sense I was thankful, in another I wondered how long it had been since I would stood on those blocks, facing a crowd of people, and what crime had I committed to end up here. The more I looked around the theatre, the more I became unnerved. Along with the rows of dead, I also discovered what I thought was the reason for the smell. The corpse had, had each either by their feet or were holding various sources of food and drinks that were now mold-ridden, or stale with algae growing on them, permeating the smell throughout the area. For a moment, I'd taken to sitting in a free seat, running along the steps, taking in the view, seeing it from the crowd's point of view, thinking what it must have been like watching these people getting convicted and shown what they had done on a big screen. Yet by doing this, I now knew I was being complicit and needed to know what it was like from the other end, even though I'd already experienced it once already. I needed to know. So taking a, a deep breath, I walked up to the stage, climbed on the platform, and stood on the block that had once belonged to Doris Deckerman. Soaking it all in, looking out at the dead crowd, it was unnerving to say the least, so much so that I couldn't stand being on the platform any longer and had to get off the stage. Moving away from the participation area, I headed back down the corridor 
and entered into the preparation area. By now, I would have thought my nose would have gotten used to the smell, yet it didn't. For now, upon entering, my senses were fully assaulted by the decay and smell. As I looked out onto a kitchen area, banks and rows of stations, all lined with various cooking utensils, pots and pans, some hanging in place on the walls, others seemed to be in mid-use. All of the food in them was spoiled and rotten, like the spiders of earlier down in the hospital wing. Here, flies buzzed around and ate at the discarded remains. Just like in the participation area, either lying over the workstations or in heaps on the floor was a workforce, all in various stages of decay. Nothing here seemed normal. Some sort of event had happened to cause everyone here to either just sit or work themselves to death. As I looked around the kitchen area towards the back end of the room, I noticed a bank of fridges and what looked like to be a freezer, which each seemed to be working. I thanked God, hoping again to incite the devil. If this was his playground, as I made my way over to the fridges and opened the first setup that I came to. Looking inside, I'd found fruit and veg. Some had gone off, yet as I rummaged through and siphoned, I managed to find some carrots and condiments, along with some flavoured juice drinks. Yes, they were out of date, but at this point I didn't care. I needed food and drink, and any that seemed edible that presented itself to me was going to be eaten. After finishing and drinking my fill, my body once more felt full, if not bloated, but I didn't care. Feeling the sense that I might need to protect myself in the future, before leaving I took one of the carving knives from the racks and proceeded back into the participation area, as a thought occurred to me that if this was a television type area, then the room I'd passed earlier would be a production room, and in that case the host would possibly have access to that room to discuss the setup of the shots with the director. So acting on that thought, I returned to the host, turning them over now, seeing the extent of their decayed body, looking something between a zombie and something you would dig up if you were grave robbing. Yet, as I searched through for the lanyard, it was nowhere to be seen. As frustration kicked in, I checked all the pockets of the suit, and sure enough, placed on the inside one was a lanyard. The lanyard carried the logo I'd seen earlier on the wall, a popular gem. Yet, I still had no clue as to what this company was all about, other than putting people on trial for the audience amusement. But maybe, just maybe, I might find something in an old television file about myself and what I was accused of. As daunting and unprepared as I could be, I left the theater of the dead and made my way back down the corridor to what I could only assume was a production office, and hopefully where all the answers lay.